I've been playing a lot of Clover Pit recently. The gambling in a cell simulator I didn't know I needed in my life. Let's go gambling. But like all games, I'm terrible at it. So let's take a deep dive into reverse engineering and hacking it to see what kind of fun we can have. If we look at the game files, we can see unityplayer.dll, so probably a Unity game. Unity games tend to be programmed in C-sharp, which means all the game code will be in the assembly-c-sharp-dll manage dll. We can use a free tool called .peek to turn this back into pretty much the original source code, which is a very nice property of managed languages. There's a lot of code here. We've got a slot machine script, which also has a lot of code, but there are some interesting things here. Function called has666, which is a part of the game mechanics. A symbol spawn. And patterns compute coroutine, which sounds interesting. In here it has a 3x5 double nested loop, which is the size of the grid of the slot machine. And it also does a bunch of checks for patterns like horizontal 3. Digging around a bit and we end up at gameplay data class. This has an array of 33 equipped power-ups, all strings with some undefined value. Oh, hang on, it's using enum to string from a power-ups enum, which is here. So this is the enumeration of all possible power-ups. There's a few other interesting bits and bobs here, symbols available and patterns available. It also does some logging about checking the aforementioned array sizes are correct. Here it initializes a bunch of different RNG instances, all with the same seed, plus a bunch of other gameplay related functions. As an aside, there's an enum for Jimbo abilities, which is a nice nod to Balatro, a game I've done a similar video on before. I think we've done enough research to start trying to interact with the game, but first, let's play a few more rounds. Okay. C-sharp hooking. I'm more comfortable with hooking native programs, and luckily for us, that's how all Unity games start. There's an exe in the game folder with the same name as the game, and this is a native binary which loads and calls into unityplayer.dll. If we step through it a bit in Ghidra, we can see it loading mono functions here. Mono is the open source implementation of Microsoft's .NET framework, and is basically what Unity uses to execute its C-sharp scripts. So the game resolves all these mono functions, but they don't seem to be referenced anywhere, nor the loaded DLL mono 20 dll Let's do some runtime analysis. From my brief research, it seems the game will need to call mono jit init version at some point. So let's set a breakpoint on the code that resolves this symbol. Okay, now that we've paused here, we can set a hardware breakpoint on the resolved address. This means we'll stop when the game actually reads it. It's called from here, and it's then used to create a domain object. It doesn't seem to persist this anywhere, but I'm sure I'm wrong, as presumably it will need to be cleaned up at some point. Although saying that, the game seems to launch a new process for the game after the mono setup. In fact, I can quit the debugger and the game keeps running. Curious. I'm definitely missing something here. I've used a tool called API Monitor to, funnily enough, monitor the API calls the game makes, and it doesn't hit any of the usual suspects for creating a new process. Yet the initial program terminates and the game runs, clearly with a different PID. Okay, so I've killed all the Steam processes, and then when I start the game, it launches Steam, so the launcher must be forcing the game to run through Steam. Fine. I've used Procmon to find the process create event from Steam, but it doesn't pass in any extra arguments or anything. I'm not sure what shenanigans are going on here, and I don't think I care. I need to get my hooks into the game, and the easiest way to do that is with DLL hijacking. Basically, when Windows starts an executable, it will also load in all the DLLs that that binary requires. However, luckily for us, it will first search in the current directory for them before reaching out to the system files. Basically, if we create a DLL the same shape as one of the system DLLs the game is expecting and just drop that into the directory of the game, then Windows will happily load that first. We can then go to the system and load the real DLL and forward all the calls onto that, which basically gives us code execution. Need to find an easy victim. Bcrypt DLL looks like a good candidate, as the game only uses one import from it. So we create that in C++, compile it, and drop it into the game folder. And it works! I programmed it to write out to a file when it's loaded, and we can see that here, so now we're in the game. Looking at how Mono works, I think what I want to do is compile my own c -sharp code into a managed DLL, and load that into the game's existing Mono runtime. That way I can probably use Reflection to find all the game's code and interact with it from there. Initially, I thought I was going to have to patch the game, 
capture the mono domain object as it's created, remove my patch, and then get the game to resume as normal. However, it turns out mono provides a mono get root domain function, which should return the previously created domain. So I've called this, drawn the requisite mono runes in the sand to load some C sharp I wrote, and it works. My code just lists all the loaded assemblies and dumps into a file, but I can see the game's code here, so we're definitely running code in the right place. Interesting development though, this has tanked my frame rate, and I have no idea why. Sounds like a problem for future Nathan. Things should be easier for us now, as we can just write our mod in C Sharp and load it. So we should just try and do something simple to influence the game, just to get started. Sounds like a problem for future Nathan. Okay, future Nathan here. This lag is unbearable. I've stripped out all the mono and logging code and it's still slow, but if I delete my hooked DLL, it runs normally. I've had a bit of a poke around and I found a player.log file the game creates. When I run the game with my bcrypt.dll, it's constantly trying to connect to Twitch and throwing exceptions. I bet the Twitch SDK doesn't like my random bcrypt DLL. <sighs> Fine, I've just rewritten the code to use another DLL, version.dll, and it now seems okay. It's almost like you're not supposed to be doing this. Anyway, back to influencing the game. Gameplay data has a private coins field, but it also has a static coin set method. In fact, it looks like this class is a singleton, which makes my life easier, as I can use reflection to get the single instance. Okay, let's try adding some coins. What's nice about this is because I'm using the game's public interface, I get all the animations and sounds as if I'd earn those coins legitimately. I think we can do more than adding coins though. Let's see if we can add some power-ups. Power-ups are a key part of the gameplay loop, and getting the right power-ups is what allows you to get the extreme scores. There's a public array of equipped power-ups, but just setting that doesn't seem to work. Presumably there's some other logic we need. Ah, there's a public static equip in power-up script, so let's invoke that from our C++ DLL. Nice. Final step is to figure out the RNG of the slots so we can force a jackpot on each spin. The slot machine script seems like a good place to start. There's a spin and stop spin method, but I'm struggling to see where the spin result is calculated. Looks like the spin data is stored in the lines member, and that is set from the start method. Okay, this all boils down to using the panic RNG raw method, which is the dev's own RNG implementation. Unfortunately, this method is not part of an interface, so there's no real way for me to provide an alternative implementation. Hmm. 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 Okay, so I've written some absolutely cursed C sharp. It might actually be a war crime. I've ensured the original RNG function is jitted, then I've grabbed the address of the jitted code and overwritten the first 12 bytes with an x86 jump to my jitted code. I am shocked this works. This is all fine, but can we take this one step further and mess with the game's native rendering? The game uses the DirectX 11 graphics API. If we launch the game with RenderDoc, we can see it briefly flash up when the first instance of the game starts and then stops. I'll spare the deep dive into the graphics API, but basically we care about a very specific object, the IDXGI swap chain, which has a method called present. A game will call this when it's finished rendering a frame and it wants to present it to the user. If we can hook this, then we know that the game is finished rendering the frame, so we can issue additional draw commands to modify that frame before the user sees it. In order to get into D3D11, we need to change our hooking library once again, this time targeting D3D11.dll. This gives us access to the initial D3D11 creation function. Now often games will use D3D11 create device and swap chain, which is exposed from the D3D11 DLL, and would allow us instant access to the swap chain. Unity however doesn't do this, instead it creates a primitive, which then creates another primitive, which then creates another primitive, etc etc etc, until eventually you end up with something that can create a swap chain. These primitives are all com objects, which is a special Microsoft construct, but basically what you get back is a pointer, to a pointer, 
to a bunch of function pointers, and it's these function pointers that we want to hook. So I've done this miserable hooking chain, but the final create swap chain is never called. Turns out there's another way to create a swap chain, create DXGI factory 2. We don't ask about create DXGI factory 1. This lives in another library, but the thought of hooking that is giving me a stomachache. There is, however, a shortcut we can take, which I've only just now realised having gone through all of this misery. The array of function pointers for the IDXGI swap chain method is static. All swap chains use the same array in memory. So if we create a fake swap chain, then we can get access to these and insert our hook. We can then throw the temporary one into the C, and when the game creates its real one, it'll have our hook already installed. Okay, so once we've done all this, what do we actually render? Well, there's a great project called Dear Imgui, which is designed for easily rendering debug UIs. It even has a bunch of helper functions for integrating directly with D3D11. So let's set up a simple window and render some text. And it crashes. It gets all the way through to my hook to present, calls my log, and presumably calls the original present I saved off. But if I print the stack trace, I can see it's calling this over and over again, which suggests my hooking isn't right. I've double and triple checked all my code, and I've come to a horrifying realisation. You can see from the stack trace that it all starts off in a Steam DLL. I'm in a hooking war with Steam. Presumably it's using similar techniques for its overlay, and we're just stepping on each other's toes. Wait, yes, Steam's patched my code. There's a rando jump now at the beginning. There's also now a jump at the start of the real present function, which goes to a trampoline, which goes to Steam code. I don't really have the effort to fight Steam, so I've done what any normal person would do. I've grabbed the original DLL from my system that has the present code in. I've then copied the first five bytes out and slapped them back into the patch function, therefore undoing the Steam hook. And look at that, a custom UI. I've tarted it up a bit and hooked in user input so I can now mouse over it and make it appear and disappear when a certain key is pressed. I've tried to detach the game's camera from the mouse when my menu is showing, however the game isn't using the normal method for getting mouse input, instead I think it's using another library, and again, I don't have the patience to hook that. We just need to accept that, whenever we use the menu, we'll probably end up just staring at the ceiling. I've updated my c -sharp DLL to retrieve all the power-ups by name, and I've wired that into the debug menu. So now when we click on a power-up, it fires off a call from C++ via mono back to the c -sharp and equips the power-up. Now all that's left is to pick some good power-ups and let it spin. Thank <laughs> you. 